History and Biography is sponsored by Wells Fargo. Foner, a professor emeritus of history at Columbia University, and um, I'm coming to you from the study in my apartment uh, opposite Columbia University uh, in New York City. This is where I write. This is where I work. Um, I do want to point out that the um, bookcase behind me, um, when I retired from Columbia a couple of years ago, I had about 3,000 books in my office there. I gave them all away because I could not get them back into my apartment here, except for the books on that bookcase, which are most of which are books written by my former students, about 200 of them, by graduate students, undergraduates. Those are the most valuable books to me, things that my students have written in the, in, on American history. So anyway, uh, I'm here to talk about the second founding, my book about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, which were ratified uh, during the period of Reconstruction, immediately after the American uh, Civil War. Um, the title of the book actually <laughs> explains the argument, the second founding. My argument is that these three amendments created a new constitution. They were not just additions to an existing structure. The 13th irrevocably abolished slavery in this country, which had been protected in the original Constitution. The 14th, for the first time, declared that anyone born in the United States, with a few tiny exceptions, is a citizen of the United States, regardless of race, religion, national origin, or anything like that. Um, and that those citizens, and indeed all persons in the country, are entitled to the equal protection of the laws. The 14th Amendment put the idea of equality among all Americans into the Constitution for the first time. The 15th Amendment tried to guarantee the right of African-American men to vote throughout the entire country. Now, all three of these amendments had flaws. Um, they were compromises. The 13th allowed involuntary servitude to continue for people convicted of crime, a loophole that later allowed for the creation of a giant system of convict leasing in the southern states. Um, the 14th um, seat did not give anyone the right to vote. It penalized states if they denied any group of men the right to vote. Uh, it was the 15th that expanded the right to vote to African-American men. It did not give the right to vote to women, although the Women's rights movement at that time was uh, very active and very disappointed in that amendment. Um, but nonetheless, as I say, this was a revolution in the Constitution, and it created the Constitution that we really are living with today. Particularly, the 14th Amendment has been the vehicle in the 20th and into the 21st century where, uh, through which uh, the courts have tremendously expanded the rights the, the claims to equality for all Americans, not just African Americans who were the main focus in, in 1866, but the most recent major decision had to do with marriage equality for gay men and lesbians. Uh, that was not on the agenda in 1866, but it's, an, it, it's a legitimate reading of the concept of equality in the uh, 14th uh, Amendment. Um, the 15th Amendment did not uh, or as say, left open other means of disfranchising people, uh, literacy tests, poll taxes, other things like that, uh, which were not explicitly racial. And we're seeing the results of that today in efforts around the country to suppress the right to vote while not violating, at least according to the courts, uh, the 15th Amendment. So the final point about my book is its argument is that these issues are relevant today. Citizenship, voting rights, um, terrorism, the Ku Klux Klan of the Reconstruction days was agitated to try to overturn these amendments. Uh, so you can't really understand where we're at today in the struggle for racial justice without 
um, knowing something about the Reconstruction era and this rewriting of the Constitution. I was inspired to write this book for a number of reasons. You know, I've written a lot on Reconstruction over the course of my uh, academic career. Um, but I began to wonder, this is maybe about eight, nine years ago, um, how what we do as historians affects the rulings of courts, particularly the Supreme Court, about, about interpreting uh, these constitutional amendments. Um, what books do they cite? Do, what, how, how long did the old view of Reconstruction as just a period of misgovernment and corruption in which uh, vindictive radicals ran roughshod over the South and ignorant blacks created a travesty of democracy, that we don't hold that view anymore. But there was a long time where historians portrayed Reconstruction that way. Well, anyway, I began looking at Supreme Court decisions uh, over the decades, and I was astonished to see how long this old view of Reconstruction survived in footnotes, in offhanded remarks, uh, of Supreme Court uh, decisions. And um, it, it got me into thinking, as I say, of how do the works of historians affect public discourse and legal uh, decision making? Well, to understand that, you have to then go back and say, well, what were they trying to accomplish in the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments? And doing that uh, led me to also kind of think that there's a vast law journal literature on this, much of it extremely good. But uh, too often it focuses almost entirely on debates in Congress, court judgments. It never gets outside the beltway. And if there's one thing about Reconstruction, it's that this was a period where the foundations of our political system were being debated up and down the society. As Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, they were debated in pulpits, in, in in uh, political gatherings, in every at every fireside, in people's homes. But you got no sense of that in what I call popular constitutionalism in much of the literature. And that expanding the sphere to include popular debates then enables you to bring an African-American voice into the debate because blacks were not in Congress when the 13th and 14th Amendments were ratified. Uh, they were there a few when the 15th was. Um, but, um, you know, that. But they're out there agitating. They're out there making claims to equal citizenship, which affect the debates in Congress and the ratification of these uh, amendments. So eventually I just decided that I, I wanted to write about them. It's a fairly short book. It's not a whole history of Reconstruction, but that the importance of these amendments have been uh, to some extent neglected and that the way the courts have interpreted them have failed to uh, utilize them to the full extent of their possible power as a weapon against racial injustice. And now, today, with what's been going on in our country in the year 2020, um, that is much more re that is more relevant than ever. As we're still grappling with the question of racial justice in this country, I think we need to go back to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And there's unused latent power there that. Congress and the courts can use to promote uh, greater equality in the United States. The 13th Amendment irrevocably abolished slavery throughout the country. Remember, the Emancipation Proclamation left many slaves still in bondage, maybe three quarters of a million of them. Now slavery is abolished irrevocably everywhere. But in the language of the 13th Amendment itself, is what we call this criminal exemption, that involuntary servitude can be demanded of people convicted of a crime. This was not considered very, it was barely discussed at the time because there were hardly any felons, there were hardly any jails at that time. But later, it became the basis of a massive system of convict labor in the South where, in, after the end of Reconstruction, where the legal system was used to throw thousands of black people in jail for minor crimes, and then they would be leased out to work on uh, plantations or railroads or lumber operations, um, you know, free of charge as far as, I mean, that is so they would not be paid in any way uh, uh, for their labor. So that was a flaw in the 13th Amendment 
which is still with us today. Prison labor is still allowed by the courts because of that exemption in the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is very long, very complicated. Um, as I said, it, it introduced the concept of the equality of, of all Americans into the Constitution. Uh, and again, it did not give anyone the right to vote. It has a complicated uh, provision that if a state denies any group of men the right to vote, uh, they will lose some of their congressmen. But that has never been enforced. And of course, the women's rights movement was very uh, unhappy that the word male was put into the Constitution for the first time in the 14th Amendment, a gender distinction that hadn't existed uh, before that point. So, um, and then the 14th Amendment can be interpreted, and in fact has been by the courts, uh, to only ban what they call state action. No state can deny a person of equality before the law. No state can deny you the equal protection of the law, the uh, take away take away your life, liberty, or property without due process. The question is, does that also ban private actions, violence, conspiracies, mobs that suppress the, the, the basic constitutional rights of African Americans? And over time, the courts have ruled, no, it's only about public policy. So uh, the Klan, for example, they're not part of the state government. So uh, the courts ruled that, no, nah, really, the, the federal government can't do much about about violent actions by individuals. Uh, oh, it has to be state action. And that and that that has really limited the scope of the 14th Amendment in significant ways. But it's a possible interpretation. It's an interpretation that was chosen. On the other hand, uh, there's many other grounds where you could say the state action doctrine is really a misinterpretation of the 14th Amendment. And the 15th Amendment was couched, is couched in negative language. No state can deny any person the right to vote because of race. It does not ban many other grounds for denying people the right to vote. Literacy, paying a poll tax, property ownership, sex. It didn't allow, it didn't deny states the right to bar women from voting. And it took another 50 years for the 19th Amendment to deal with that. The point is really on this, there is no positive right to vote in our Constitution. A lot of people don't quite realize that. There are negatives. Nowadays, you cannot deny someone the right to vote because of race, because of sex, because of paying a poll tax. But there are many grounds which states continue to deny the right to vote. These voter suppression, you have to have a certain kind of ID, or if your middle initial is not on the right document when you register to vote or all sorts of other things states are trying to suppress voting. Uh, it would have been much better if the 15th Amendment had been a positive amendment. All, let us say, all sit adult citizens have the right to vote, period. And then you wouldn't have all these, certain, these methods that are used today to deny people the right to vote. So this, this is a, a, a serious problem, although it's also worth you know, noting that expanding the right to vote to African-American men throughout the country was a radical change in the political system of the United States. On the eve of the Civil War, only five states, all of them in New England, where there's hardly any black population, allowed African-American men to vote on the same basis as white. So expanding that to millions of black people um, certainly was a tremendous step forward for the history of democracy in this country. Uh, people often ask me, when did Reconstruction end? And I say, well, that depends what you mean by Reconstruction. Some people say it's a particular time period, let's say the first 12 years after the Civil War. But my view is Reconstruction is a process, the process by which the United States tried to come to terms with the destruction of slavery the process by which we created an agenda and tried to fulfill it of racial justice in this country. Uh, if that's the definition of Reconstruction, it never ended. We are still in Reconstruction. As you just look in our streets this year, these Reconstruction issues of equality, of the right to vote, of equal protection, I'm not just talking about the abstraction of the law, physical protection on the streets, 
against violence by police. That was a reconstruction issue, and that's still on our agenda uh, right now. So in that sense, and, and by the way, Congress understood that when they wrote the three amendments, all of them end with a clause saying Congress will have the power to enforce this. In other words, they're looking to future action. These are not just one-off moments. They, set, they created a situation where Reconstruction would go on and on as Congress saw what was needed or new issues arose. But the problem is that the Constitution, as the you know, saying goes, is what the Supreme Court says it is. And over the years, first of all, in the late 19th century, the Supreme Court just gutted the 14th and 15th Amendments. Um, uh, really allowing the rise of the Jim Crow system, which completely denied the equality politically and civil rights, social rights of African Americans. They were clear and utter violations of the principles of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And yet the Supreme Court allowed all of those things, disenfranchisement, uh, you know, the collapse of black education in the South, uh, a, um, a, a, um, uh, a system, uh, an economic system where all the good jobs are reserved for whites and blacks are at the bottom. All that was allowed by the Supreme Court, uh, despite the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Now, in the mid to late 20th century, the Warren Court, etc., began reinterpreted the 14th Amendment to some degree and used it to allow the legislation of the civil rights era to be uh, enacted and enforced. But really, ever since the Nixon administration, the Supreme Court has been pulling back from vigorous civil rights enforcement. And their interpretation of the 14th Amendment has become uh, more cramped and, and limited. Uh, today, the court is more interested in the possible damage to white people, let us say, from affirmative action programs, than to efforts to try to uplift those who have suffered uh, discrimination throughout our history. Uh, today, the Supreme Court is perfectly happy to see the right to vote suppressed in state after state. In the famous Shelby County decision back, uh, Shelby County v. Holder, uh, several years ago, basically they just chucked out the um, um, uh, Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965 and gave a free hand to states to deny people the right to vote if they felt like it. And that has reinvigorated the suppression of the right to vote in many states. So Reconstruction was a critical moment in the history of American democracy, but we are still trying to live up to its purposes. I, I interpret ingenuity, the theme of this book uh, festival, uh, as sort of reflecting moments where people actually have to think in new ways about an unfamiliar situation. And certainly in the era of the Civil War, uh, to come to terms with the, uh, the war itself and then the destruction of the institution of slavery required an amazing amount of ingenuity or innovation or simply sloughing off, as Lincoln said in, in the middle of the war, the dogmas of the quiet past. The dogmas of the past were no longer relevant to the future that came out of the Civil War. So the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are efforts, flawed but remarkable anyway, uh, efforts by people who aren't really household names today. John Bingham in Congress, James Ashley in Congress, Henry Wilson in Congress. Uh, these are not widely known figures. And yet they had to try to figure out how do we make this a just society? in the aftermath of slavery. And they experimented, they, uh, they, they debated at length what should be in the Constitution, how should the rights of African Americans be protected. They went down some false paths, but ultimately they created a structure which, if enforced, would still be tremendously valuable uh, to us today, a, a vision of this country as a society of equals with race just sort of evicted from the problem, from public policy, from the allocation of rights to people, severing our democracy from the tyranny of race. It took a lot of ingenuity to think about that and a lot of ingenuity to try to implement it. 
And even if it wasn't fully implemented, the possibility is still out there in our Constitution today. Remember, one last thing. When South Africa abolished apartheid, they had to write a new constitution. They were living under an apartheid constitution. When the civil rights movement came around here in the 1960s, they didn't need a new constitution. They needed the constitution we have to be enforced, which had not been for decades and decades. Um, we still have that constitution that was created during Reconstruction. And if we had a more vigorous vision of how to enforce it, I think we would move forward in a significant way uh, in the realm of racial justice in this country.